yeah, hi everyone. I am really excited to be here and present in front of you and I hope you'll find my, uh, what I've prepared interesting. So um, I'm Marta, currently I'm an infrastructure developer at fin.no and that is my Twitter handle. Um, in case you have any questions or comments about what I'm going to have to say. And I don't talk in front of such diverse uh, crowds often, so this is even more exciting. So our plan for today, my plan for today, is to talk a little bit about my background, about uh, getting into technology as someone who's kind of ended up being from the outside and things that I find interesting in my field, which is IT infrastructure. So we'll sort of go from the individual to the technological. So let's start. Like many people, I decided my career at the age of seven. I decided to I want to be a cosmonaut, which is how we in Eastern Europe call astronauts. But as someone from Eastern Europe, where I come from, coming from a working class family and having really bad eyesight, I soon realized that that's not accessible to me. So I decided to pivot to astronomer. <laughs> And I spent uh, most of my childhood immersing myself in science and technology. I learned to program in Logo, um, in C and in Pascal. I learned, uh, I read a lot of works by Richard Feynman about, um, about uh, quantum physics and string theory and, uh, and um, what can we do to go to the stars and so on. But uh, life twists and turns and that twist uh, of going from someone so interested in science and technology into someone studying English literature um, deserves a separate story that I um, uh, deserves more time that I don't have right now. So I'll just say that I ended up studying English literature and working on completely other stuff afterwards. I was a starving translator <laughs> for a while. And I only came back to science and technology to technology around seven, six years ago. And I my first job was a junior software engineer writing Ruby applications to support configuration management of servers. Um, so I started off as someone kind of belonging in the science and technology, but then life pushed me out of it. And when I tried coming back, my knowledge didn't seem relevant at all anymore. So I need needed to relearn a lot and or learn a lot of things. And I was an outsider. And I'm not saying that only because I was an outsider to technology, but I strongly believe that uh, outsiders are beneficial uh, be into any field they're in, whether it's technology or otherwise. So in general, s someone coming from the outside is going to bring a much needed diversity of thought and experiences into your field. And that person didn't probably didn't have time to develop Stockholm syndrome against all the shitty tools that you're <laughs> used to using, and that person is probably used to learning things, new things all the time, and struggling with a lot of them. And that makes that person empathetic towards your end users who might not be so technologically savvy as you, or towards people more junior um, who are starting the, their journey um, because you've been there. And you're going to be, on average, either the same or open to change, because you've changed fields at least once. But not everything is a bed of roses. Um, you don't know the rules of the game. Uh, you don't know what salary you should be getting, and so on. You don't have a network uh, and connections. Um, it's hard to get your first junior jobs, because a lot of the, description, uh, lot of the requirements for junior jobs are really advanced, actually. And you're missing all those things that you haven't uh, you haven't spent time uh, studying the topic at university, so you have gap a lot of gaps in knowledge. And then there's a lot of different ways in which you can stand out. And here today, I don't think I need to go <laughs> through the basics. Um, not having um, an IT science, uh, computer science background is just one way that you can stand out. But you can stand out in more ways. Um, as by being a woman, by being a person of color, an immigrant, especially in the context of, uh, of IT. And the more ways you stand out, the more ugly experiences you're gonna, you're most probably gonna um, uh, gather throughout your career. So you're gonna be hearing, you might be hearing 
horrible things in interviews. I, one time, when I was applying for my first job, I heard that if they would hire me, the boss couldn't take his hands off me, keep his hands off me, so it's better they don't hire me. And all this hostility that you gather through the years is going to make you doubt yourself. So when you're crying in the office bat bathroom, I've cried in the office bathroom of every IT job I had, um, it might be hard to remember why you came to IT in the first place. Is it money? It's fine if it's just money. I mean, fina financial stability lowers your cortisol levels, so that's a good thing. Um, but maybe there's something else. What is it? If it's not money, what is it that makes you tick, that makes you want to wake up, um, go to work when you go to your work, when you wake up in the morning? So when I ask myself that question, when I doubt myself, um, my decisions, maybe it was better to starve as a translator of medical books, um, I like to remind myself and think about how dynamic IT systems are, and I think that it's really interesting to watch how they evolve. And I thought that since we're here, a group of people coming from diverse tech backgrounds, I thought that what you could also find interesting is uh, me talking about IT systems, IT infrastructure systems, and on a higher level. So here is my short list of the four most important thing, uh, shifts in IT infrastructure that happened since I joined um, technology myself. So when you think about the old times, and I mean like seven, <laughs> seven years ago, um, maybe that, <laughs> that, already, that process already started, but maybe some of you remember buying their software on CDs. I do. My dad used to do that quite often too. So we used to physically own our software. Was it buying a CD or downloading an executable from the internet? But these days, more and more applications, the software that we use, we don't buy, we don't buy the software itself, we buy access to it. So that brings uh, quite a few um, a number of consequences. That means that our si IT systems need to evolve and adapt. For example, you're gonna have may way more internet traffic to, and you need IT infrastructure to support the growing traffic because you need uh, to have c connections to the software that you're uh, buying access to. And um, as companies or organizations that create software, um, you're more and more, we become more and more responsible for actually running the software, not just, um, it's not the user anymore. So that means that um, what followed was, for example, a shift in observability tools and how we monitor our software. And I find that very interesting. So we don't, we used to have monitoring software that was basically a collection of bash scripts, pinging your application, checking if it's, if it's doing okay or not. But these days, the way the monitoring tools evolved is that it, it, you need to, um, collecting metrics about how your application is doing is already becoming part of your um, software design. And you can collect information on how your software is doing on function level. And I think that's pretty amazing. Um, that shift is pretty amazing, I think, personally. And then a consequence of this shift to servicing software from owning it was that organizations, uh, software organizations needed, um, required more and more operational knowledge and more and more people to run the software and the hardware that the software is running on. And that meant that suddenly you had more costs and not, um, and not everyone could afford that for various reasons. So a lot of, more and more of those operational aspects have been, um, become outsourced to cloud providers like Google Cloud or AWS. And now, these days, you can build, test, run, yeah, deploy, run, and um, maintain your entire, m almost entire software uh, life cycle of your software using just one, a single, using a single cloud provider. And I'm not, um, I'm not proposing vendor lock-in, um, but I'm saying what I'm saying is that it's becoming way easier for uh, smaller companies to bring their product to market quicker, because they don't need all that operational knowledge in house. And for other companies, it's way easier to do high availability, because all that um, 
all that knowledge and um, all the time spent on designing those, um, maintaining those high available available systems uh, falls on the uh, shoulders of cloud providers. And a third thing I think is worth mentioning is a shift that's a uh, shift in software architecture, but it actually has implications on how, uh, on how we IT infrastructure people need to work to, to maintain um, the software products. So if you picture Finn's website, it looks like a single website with a lot of links and so on. And Finn used to be a single, um, a single web website, a single executable that would, de that would be deployed every few weeks and um, would have all those tens of thousands lines of code. But with time, and that's a process that's, big, that, that's not unique to Finn, with time, Finn's website, the whole executable, was being uh, separated into smaller services where each of them does one thing, does it well, and those services communicate with each other using APIs. So Finn went from having a monolithic architecture to having a microservice architecture. And currently there's around, I don't want to lie, that number changes a lot, but um, I think there's around 600 microservices that work together to give you um, the end user a feeling of one website. And so the benefits of having a microservice architecture is that um, it's easier for you to change your application because you know that this one service you change is probably not going to break down the whole application. I said probably. Those things can still happen, but they happen less, way less often. But another consequence is that now you have 600 or however many uh, 100 services that you need to coordinate deplo their deployments and so on, and that's become impossible to do by hand. So that means that new tools have to had to emerge to be able to um, automate that, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute. And lastly, what I think was a shift that um, that applied that was important not only for us in IT infrastructure, but for technology in general, is the shift, uh, well, it's not a shift, it's more like um, we've been hearing about those different scandals related to technology, like Cambridge Analytica, uh, different privacy concerns, um, data breaches, or we've been talking more and more about the impact technology has on the environment or on the job market. And these scandals are very bad. Those things shouldn't be happening. But the fact that we are talking about them, we're having articles and huge newspapers, we're having press conferences about them, we're having talks on a governmental and on an international level, I think that's, that's good because we're finally mature enough to talk about how technology companies have been unregulated and how we need this sort of regulation and we need to own up to the responsibility that we actually have. Um, and all of that can lead to us learning and for the greater good. So, as I mentioned when I talked about, um, when I mentioned microservice architecture, um, we seem to be adding more additional abstraction layers to our, to our IT systems. And I wanted to talk a little more about that. So when you think about the old times, you used to have um, you used to have servers. You still have servers as, as the basic building blocks of systems. Or those are physical machines. But with time, we realize that ser servers by themselves aren't um, aren't efficient enough. So we added a virtualization. So we added a virtualization layer on top uh, that let us isolate, um, use the use the resources better, and isolate our processes more. And now we can fit multiple machines in one. But with time, with time, that turned out to not be enough. So uh, we found a way to isolate processes without that virtualization layer to be even more efficient at uh, using our resources. And that's how container technologies like Docker, that you maybe heard of, uh, came into being. And we can now we can put multiple Docker containers on multiple VMs on one server. And then, like I mentioned uh, when I talked about microservice architecture, is that we need now we need a way to orchestrate 
um, all of those services, all of those Docker containers. And that's where tools like platforms like Kubernetes came to be, which let you abstract away some of the administration toil and also automate away other things like out of sca scaling or disaster recovery so you can save time and increase your efficiency. And then around the same time, more or less, that Kubernetes came, uh, other people, some people asked themselves a question. Why should we deal be dealing with servers at all if we're application de developers? So that's when uh, serverless came to be. And serverless is basically another layer of abstraction that just uh, thrives to abstract away the server. So you, as an application developer, don't need to think about the servers at all, and they should, that shouldn't be your concern. And people who are entering IT now, when you think about the practical tool set, uh, skill set that they need to have, is um, they're not gonna, most probably not gonna start with learning about servers and kernel calls and a system calls and the kernel quirks. They're gonna probably start by learning about containers because that seems to be more useful and more relevant for a typical application developer or even an IT infrastructure person these days. And it means that it's getting more and more, it's basi basically getting exponentially harder to become an, I, a generalist in the field of IT infrastructure and to stay one because there's all those new abstraction layers that you need to, um, that pop up from time to time that you need to get yourself familiar with. And when I try uh, reasoning about um, those systems or IT systems and how they evolve and what might lie in the future, I like to think about our infrastructure systems as, um, as a tree. I think they grow the way a tree would grow. And when you're on the outside, when you imagine a tree, you're on the outside on the outermost smallest branch, it might be hard for you to trace, to see where that branch is actually actually originating from uh, from the trunk. And that's a, and you can imagine that the trunk is the phys a physical server and the first abstraction layer would be an operating system, let's say. So trees grow in a fractal, uh, in a fractal way. It's cool that I'm not the first person talking about fractals today. And fractals are a very organic and natural pattern. They're all, all over nature. And I find it fascinating that, um, that we're reproducing that pattern in human-made systems. And our IT sim systems are becoming more and more complex. And I think I'll have the audacity to say that they're slowly starting to rival the complexity of nature. And as someone who spent a decade immersed in learning about uh, systems of nature, and the natural order of things, I find a lot of pleasure and a lot of comfort in thinking about IT infrastructure that way. So that's all that I prepared for you today. I hope I learned the privilege of your time. And I will publish the slides and a link to a written version of this talk later this week. Thank you very much.